you're listening to sermon audio from Ankeny Free Church in Ankeny, Iowa, a community in Christ on a mission to reach our community for Christ. To learn more, head over to ankenyfree.church. You know, it's Labor Day weekend, and I know most of you work and have jobs, and if you're like most people, there's some part of your job that you just don't like, right? So if you're a chef, maybe you hate cleaning out the grease traps. You know, if you're a police officer, maybe the paperwork is enormous and something you didn't really envision when you, when you signed up for the force. If you are Nebraska football coach Matt Rule, you know, there you are living your dream coaching football and yet every morning you wake up and you're just struck with the realization that of all the teams in the world that you coach it has to be Nebraska there are things I imagine about people's lives that are just very very hard it's a small joke right okay so just I see you I see you getting out your phones and whatever some of you standing up it's all right just calm down well, if, if a normal job can have bad things, sometimes being a prophet, especially in the Old Testament, can be really hard too. You know, just think of Ezekiel and all the things that he had to do, like cutting his hair and dividing it into thirds and burning it and giving it away and putting some of it in his clothes. And it's just like, well, I don't, I don't like this part of the job, Lord. Or maybe just think of Jeremiah. The Lord tells him to buy some property right before the Babylonians take over the city. He's like, it's just not a good time. It's not a, it's not a good time to buy, to buy real estate here in the city. Or maybe Isaiah, who had to preach for three years naked. It's like, oh, Lord, this is, not, this is not what I like. This is not my favorite part. Well, Jonah, it appears, he is a prophet of the Lord he does not like doing what God says. And maybe it's just this instance, or maybe there's a heart that's hardened there, but clearly Jonah has an issue with obeying the Lord. And that's what we're going to look at today. Um, not just disobedience, but particularly religious disobedience. Now, before we begin, I want to look here at the book of Jonah itself. It is an amazing little book. It's different as a prophetic book. It's a, it's a story here of Jonah going throughout. And I want you to notice here that there are some dynamic things going on in the book. Chapter 1 is very similar to chapter 3, where you have uh, the word of the Lord. You have Jonah responding to the word of the Lord. And then you have Jonah working there in God's kind of world, this pagan environment that he's not wanting to be a part of. And then in chapter 2, it's a lot like chapter 4, where it's really just Jonah and the Lord. And they're able to interact. And we learn about the heart of Jonah, but also the heart of God. What we see that there's all kinds of interesting things here with word play. Next week, we'll look at the word like hurl. You'll see that God hurls a wind. Uh, the, the soldiers hurl cargo, and then ultimately they hurl Jonah. There's a lot of interesting wordplay that goes on. There's a lot of similar and repeated ideas. Uh, many have said, well, maybe this isn't a real story. It's just a parable. The problem with that is I understand it's difficult to think of a great fish swallowing someone for three days. Maybe even more so. It's just the beautiful and ironic way that this is written. It's like, this is just so fascinating. It's almost too good to be true. But I would say that in Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 38, the way that the Lord Jesus refers to this, he refers to it as, as an event that happened. And so I think that's enough for me. If Jesus says we're good, I say we're good, even if it just seems beyond our imagination. There are a few things that I want you to do here in addition 
to just showing up on Sunday mornings. In between each of our times in Jonah, I want you to read through the book of Jonah once every week. It's not very long. On most Bibles like mine, it just covers two pages, four short chapters, extremely interesting. I want you to notice uh, some of the words, some of the phrases, some of the things, the way that Jonah reacts, the way that God actually acts here in the midst of this. I want you to, to use your Bibles and to maybe highlight or take notes off to the side. I want you to be invested and to study this week after week after week while we are going through the book of Jonah. I want you to watch the Bible Project video, which should be on the small group sheet. And if you're familiar with the Bible Project, it'll, it gives a great literary overview of the book of Jonah. And, and the nice thing about the book of Jonah, it's short, it's able for us to it's easier for us to wrap our arms around it to better understand an entire book from beginning to end. I also want you on Sunday mornings, if you would, bring a paper Bible. I know that many of you bring your phones, and that's fine, and it's, that usually works out great on our normal Sundays. But when we're in the book of Jonah, we're going to be looking around the whole book and kind of bouncing around, and that's a little bit hard for you to do with a phone. And I would like either your paper copy or if you want, you can bring your phone for a second copy, but for one of those to be the ESV. Now, there's lots of great translations. Um, a Christian Standard Bible, I'm an old New American Standard Bible guy. Some of you are old NIV people, like KJV, NKJV. There's all kinds of, you know, maybe your New Living, whatever. And, and they're all fantastic. The, the reason I want this for this series is because we'll be looking at some of the specific words, and I want you to be able to see the same words that I'm talking about, rather than going, well, mine doesn't say that. Because the words are going to be important. There's a lot of play on words that are going here, and I want you to see that. In fact, we're going to see a number of them even today. So with that, let's turn to Jonah chapter 1. Uh, for this series, we're going to stand for the reading of the Word. Um, that's what Jesus did in Luke chapter 4. When he read the book of Isaiah, he, he stood and, and read it out loud out of reverence for God's Word. And so we're going to do that for this series. So if you would please stand. Now the Word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found the ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for your grace here in this moment that we might see something that we haven't seen before. Lord, I know that many of us, maybe we have additional plans for the day, and so our mind is fixed on that. Maybe our hearts are filled with grief at the loss of a loved one or to seeing our loved ones struggle. Maybe the book of Jonah, we just say it's, it's familiar, I got it, I know it. And so we miss the work of your Spirit here in it and in this moment. And so, Lord, I pray that what we walk away from today is not human wisdom, but, Lord, we want to hear your word and have your Spirit transform our hearts. So I pray that you would speak through me or in spite of me. But, Lord, we ask that it would be you that speaks now here in this moment. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we see here the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Now, Jonah is a real person. We do have some other insight about Jonah. Here in 2 Kings chapter 14, um, we see that Jonah is an actual prophet. He's a prophet of Jeroboam, what is known as Jeroboam II. And this is during a rather particularly good time in Israel's history. This would have already been after the split between the northern and southern kingdom, but both the northern and southern kingdom are really growing and flourishing. There, there is ground that has been taken over. 
the threat of Assyria, which was much more severe in earlier times, particularly like the reign of Jehu, whom we have an obelisk in the British Museum showing him giving a tribute to the king of Assyria. Um, those days have passed. And so now we are in a time where Assyria is kind of weak. Of course, this won't last for very long. Assyria will come marching down here before too long. But it's during this time that Jonah was a prophet. And he was a court prophet. And he served the king Jeroboam II, a king who did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And this is what it says. That he restored the border of Israel from Libo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by, here it is, his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Gath Hefer. So here's Jonah. Jonah's a real guy. He's not made up. He's an actual person, and that's who God is calling here. And so we see Jonah. This Jonah is being spoken to by the word of the Lord. Now, what does God say? Well, we see it here. Verse 2, there are three commands. Arise, go, and call out. He's to get up, and he's to go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh, it is the key city, sometimes capital, of Assyria. This is rather unusual for a prophet to be sent to another place, a pagan, non-Hebrew, non-Jewish, non-Israelite area in order to preach, but this is exactly what's going to happen. What's actually a little more interesting here is that it's Assyria. The Bible talks a lot about Assyria, and we know that it is a ruthless place. Assyria is known for their conquest. They take people from their geography they mix them with other people, depriving them of common ethnicity, and they put the Assyrian gods, and so they lose the bond of any sort of religious identity that they had. They are key assimilators, and they are brutal, particularly in siege warfare. Oftentimes, they would come upon a city, and they would take inhabitants that aren't inside the walled city, and they would skin them alive, they would chop off heads of those that they captured and lobbed them over to the city to decrease morale. When they captured the city, they would force those that they had taken prisoner to walk with poles with the heads of their loved ones sat atop them. Sometimes they would come upon enemy soldiers that they had defeated and they would cut off their legs and one of their arms and shake their hand, congratulating them on the victory as they bled out in mockery. Their art, well, you can kind of see some of this in the British Museum again. I remember this fresco, this relief that was there on one of the tablets that they had preserved. And it shows the king and the queen sitting in this park. And it looks like they're having just a delightful time. They have a glass of wine in their hand. They have servants bowing before them. And there's these beautiful trees. But the trees are decorated with human heads. The Assyrian people, violence was their art. Uh, demonic uh, possession and using demons in order to curse their enemies, that was the foundation of their religion. And their culture was one of bloodthirsty conquest. And so we can maybe understand why this is rather shocking. And we don't have to dig in the dirt to see these things, the Places like Nahum and other, other books talk a lot about the Assyrians. They are a constant plague to the people, and eventually they wind up taking over Israel not long, not long after Jonah lived. And so that's Nineveh. But Nineveh is called a great city, verse 2. The word great is used many times here in the book of Jonah. And we need to maybe try to figure out what makes this city great. Certainly its size. Certainly its population. But we realize that this city is great because the Lord cares about it. And it's in this great city that Jonah is to call out against it. 
And the reason he's to call out against it is because of their evil, which has come up before me. The word evil is a key word in the book of Jonah. It's the Hebrew word ra'ah. And in English, we have a separate word for evil and for disaster, right? One has a, a definite moral connotation. The other is kind of just these unfortunate circumstances. But in the Hebrew, the word ra'ah covers both of those ideas. And that's the word that's used. If you have an ESV or maybe your Bible translation, the word evil might have a little note noting that it means either evil or disaster. And it'll be translated um, in English depending on the context of what that means. But just know that's kind of the same Hebrew word and they're kind of tapping into that. This idea of Jonah um, rising and going and calling is seen repeated throughout the book of Jonah. It's seen in chapter 3 where those exact words are repeated. We see it as you go down as the captain is asking Jonah to rise up and to call out echoes of what God has commanded him to do. And here we see Jonah obeying, at least the first word, he rises. But then after that, it's just disobedience. Jonah begins to flee. And he flees to Tarshish. Now, we're not sure if Tarshish is a city, is a city in Spain or if it's on the Arabian Peninsula. But quite frankly, it doesn't matter because Tarshish is not Nineveh. Jonah is going to not Nineveh. He is not going where he should go. He is fleeing somewhere else. And curiously, and this will be brought up more, he's fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Oh, the irony. He not only flees, but he goes down. We see that he goes down to Joppa. Now, biblically, he probably would have actually gone down if he was in Shechem, down to the coastal city of, J of Joppa. He's up higher. That makes sense. But going down means something different in the Bible usually. You almost always go up to Jerusalem. Now, I get it. It's on a mount, high hill there. So oftentimes you are physically going up. And anytime you go away from Jerusalem, you're going down. And it doesn't matter if you come at it from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west. It, it's the same. But it also means something theologically. And for here, Jonah, he's not just descending in elevation, but he's going down spiritually. And we see Jonah beginning his great descent. I don't know if you guys picked up one of these bookmarks that Matthew made but this is fantastic, and this is a great picture for the book of Jonah. Jonah is heading down, down, down. He's going down to Joppa. He's going to go, as the passage says, down into the ship. We'll find out later he not only went down into the ship, he went down into the inner part or the belly of the ship. It's not going to be the only belly Jonah goes down into. Jonah is on this downward trajectory, and it's because of his disobedience. Well, so what do we do with this? So what do we do with this passage? Well, there's two things I want us to focus on. Disobedience and deliverance. Disobedience and deliverance. With disobedience... Uh, Jesus tells us in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Uh, Jesus and the Lord is really the only one that can say that in that way. Uh, we don't get to tell other people, if you love me, you will obey what I say. Right. And in fact, if, if you truly love someone else, you will obey what the Lord says. That's the way it works. And it's because he is God, he is good, he is sovereign, and, and there is no mixed motives there with the Lord. And so we see that there's this heart of obedience that is found when we follow the Lord, right? So when we think about disobedience, one of the pictures that comes to mind is that of a non-religious person being disobedient. Uh, Foul-mouthed, you know, they, they hate anything good, uh, 
Maybe they're standing on the street corner, giving obscene gestures to those that, that pull into the church, maybe peeing on the church sign, you know, saying all sorts of foul things. You know, we get the picture, right? Disobedience. Clearly this person does not care about the things of the Lord, and we all know it. But there's a different type of disobedience. One that I think that we might even see here in our midst, and it's a religious disobedience. That's what we see with Jonah. You see, Jonah, Jonah knows the scriptures. Boy, he's able to quote them. Oh, wait till we get to chapter 2, and you will see either the finest or the worst prayer in the world. It is a work of art, of knitting together so many different biblical passages. Jonah knows exactly what his role is, and yet he does not obey. Oftentimes, when a person is disobedient but religious, in their heart they think, I have to do good things in order that God would love me. They don't understand the grace of God. They understand that, that man, I, I need to work, right? They're, they're deceived into thinking, I've got I to gotta somehow earn this relationship with God. Uh, and then it grows. The, the religious person then thinks after a time of doing really good that then God owes them, right? God, you owe me. Bad things can't happen because I sit here Sunday after Sunday listening to this guy talk, and you tell me it's so much suffering that I have to endure just to follow you. I've given, I've sacrificed. I've I've followed your ways. I've resisted temptation. You owe me. Bad things can't happen to my life. You need to start answering some of my prayers. And then the arrogance settles in. We begin to judge those around us. Uh, They're not doing as well as I am. I must be better. I must be God's favored. Uh, They deserve his destruction. I deserve whatever good things the Lord would have for those with whom he is pleased. The, the, The disobedient person begins to work very hard at their exterior. They want to look the part. It it is like having a house that's well-painted, but inside it has no furniture. It's like a house that has a perfectly manicured lawn, but the bathrooms are an absolute disaster. It looks great on the outside, but on the inside it's rotten. And that's what you often find when people are religious but disobedient. You begin to see that, yes, on the outside, they, they talk a big game when it comes to sexual purity, but in their heart... There's so much covetousness and greed. Oh, sure, you might not hear a swear word out of them, but in their mind and and with their non-cursing words, they are destroying those around them. These are the people that Jesus has his harshest words for, the Pharisees. They were religious, but they missed a key aspect of who God is. Uh, They missed the ideas of love and compassion and care and being on the same page as having the same heart as the Lord. Instead, they were just concerned with themselves and protecting their own, as opposed to seeing the world through the Lord's eyes. You know, for all their deception, Probably the person that's most deceived is the religious disobedient person themselves. They begin to think of themselves wrongly and distort reality. It's a lot like Jonah. Uh, Jonah in chapter 2, he'll talk like he's standing in the temple offering his prayers to the Lord. But the reality is, is that he's in the belly of a great fish at the bottom of the sea. And that's oftentimes where the religiously disobedient person is. And I think the book of Jonah, as we start out, gives us an opportunity to examine our own heart. Not how are we doing on the outside, but how are we doing on the inside? Uh, Has the Lord really touched 
our heart deep down. The second thing we see is deliverance. And oh, I love this. Jonah, look, he stinks throughout the entire book. If you've not read it, he's no good all the way from beginning to end. Uh, Even in his bright moments, I think, oh, they're still heavily tainted. But Jonah wasn't the only one sent by the Lord. We see that the father sends the son. The son didn't reluctantly go, but gladly went. And and we learn in Luke 19.11 that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his purpose. Uh, That was why he came. He didn't try to get out of reaching the Ninevites. He, He came for them and for us, for you and for me. Now, I know in the text of Jonah... He's not portrayed very well. But when we get to chapter 4, I I have a lot of hope for Jonah. And I see the Lord is concerned not just with the people of Nineveh and not just with the sailors, but with Jonah himself. And that can give some of us hope. Because I don't know about you, but growing up, I was a Pharisee. I was Jonah. Jonah. I thought God loved me because I was better than other people. I thought that, that if I worked hard, I would have God's favor. I understood a lot about Jesus, but I did not know him. And it wasn't really until the Lord opened my eyes through a friend where, where I saw my need for, my, for a Savior, and then I saw my Savior. And I realized it, it wasn't through work, but humility, brokenness, and trust that I'm rescued, that I'm saved. And in this book, we see deliverance, not just for the non-righteous, irreligious people of this world, but also for the religiously disobedient Pharisees as well. We're going to have a time where we take the Lord's Supper. And the way this is going to work is that during the time, I'm going to have um, some of our elders come forward, and you're going to be served And so come up in small groups of four or ish and you you grab the bread and you grab the cup and then you kind of all just take it right there together. And then you move on and the next small group comes up. We just want to do that to take some time every now and again. We just want to spend a little extra time because I want you to reflect on what God might have for you here. I want you to think about whether or not there's some disobedience in your heart. Now, now, before we divide kind of down the middle and you guys come in and form a line and kind of circle around, um, if, if it starts going haywire, I'll redirect the flow. Um, I, I want you to think about your own life. Now, if you are not a follower of the Lord Jesus, um, and you're like, I'm still not a follower of the Lord Jesus, then use this time to sit and reflect. You know, God, why do you have me here? What is it that you want me to see? But if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus, I think it's a good opportunity to ask, what is it that you want to show me? As I come freshly before the cross, where do you want to show me something again that I need to yield before you? What way am I not seeing this world as you would have me see it? Where do I need to turn to you and freshly receive your grace? as we are reminded of Jesus' body that's been broken for us and his blood that's been shed for us. So I'm going to pray for us. We pray you are blessed and encouraged by this week's message, and we invite you to join us every Sunday, in person or online, for morning worship. Have questions about what it means to know and follow Jesus? Simply email Todd at ankenyfree.church. Thanks for listening.